arson, famine, feces, lack of potable water, price gouging, mob rule, and bone-crushing riots. During the summer of 1999, the music industry tried to recreate the peaceful spirit of the 60s. Instead, it choked the life out of the 90s and threw its lifeless corpse on top of a 20-foot-tall bonfire. Today, we're going to find out how Woodstock 99 went off the rails. But before we get going, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what music phenomenon, person, or event you'd like us to cover next. Now, let's go back to the last weekend in July of 1999, when new metal ruled the airwaves. With an anticipated crowd of 250,000 people, plus several thousand more vendors, medical personnel, security police, and music journalists, festival promoters should have had an idea as to how chaotic Woodstock 99 might get. Instead, the organizers seemed thrilled about the estimated attendance. They bragged to reporters during a press conference about the scope of the festival and how Rome, New York, had become the third most populated city in the state after New York City and Buffalo, if only for the four-day weekend. Even the performers were impressed by the amount of people who showed up. Art Alexoxis, the guitarist for Everclear, recalled the moment his band stepped on stage for their afternoon set. When we walked out, the crowd was as far as I could see. The sound of 200,000 people singing your song back to you, well, I can't even tell you what it sounds like, man. Looking back now, scheduling Woodstock 99 to take place during July was a horrible idea. The temperature averaged 100 degrees during the week of the festival. Then factor in the event's location. Woodstock 69 took place on the lush fields of a dairy farm in Bethel, New York, with nearby rivers, creeks, and massive leafy trees, which the hippies used to cool down, bathe, and hide from the sun. Woodstock 99 was held on Griffiths Air Force Base. Constructed in the 1940s, the base was used for military aircraft maintenance. There were some areas of turf, but for the most part, Woodstock 99 happened on 1,100 acres of airplane runways. The grounds were so expansive, visitors had to travel a mile and a half between two main stages. This is how Rolling Stone journalist Rob Sheffield described the scene. It was a few miles of asphalt surrounded by barbed wire. There were a few patches of grass. But for instance, if you were looking for some grass to lie down on, you're not going to lie under a tree or on a hillside. You're not going to see any flowers. It was a place that was designed to house jet fighters. Kevin Wasserman, the Offspring's lead guitarist, you know him as Noodles, was even more critical of the locale. We played this festival in Nuremberg at an old Third Reich Park. So I've played a venue that was literally built by Hitler that was more hospitable than that Air Force base was. More than 3,000 private guards, hundreds of Woodstock Peace Patrol volunteers, around 500 New York State troopers, and local police were brought on to make Woodstock 99 run smoothly. It wasn't enough. That number could have doubled, but it wouldn't have mattered. Security never had a chance. Not that security knew what they were doing, anyway. One Woodstock Peace Patrol volunteer told a Syracuse Post Standard journalist, it was like, sign the sheet and you're certified security. And it's not like real law enforcement knew any better. In fact, numerous state troopers were suspended after the festival for posing with nude women and making suggestive comments to women overheard by those in attendance. By the end of the festival, only half of the staff remained, the rest having either quit or been fired. Imagine around a quarter of a million people trapped in a concrete pen surrounded by barbed wire. Now imagine shutting off that population's water supply. Unless you were working the festival, that was your life for four straight days. Of course, festival attendees had two choices. They could either buy a 12-ounce bottle of water for $4, $6.20 if you adjust for inflation, or stand in line for free faucet water from spigots that were sparsely located up to a half mile away from the main stages. The wait in these lines took hours. Eventually, people got frustrated by their shabby water conditions and started destroying the water spigots, their only free source of water. Break stuff, remember? This caused pipes to burst, allowing water to overflow into the nearby portable toilets. The result was a brown soup consisting of mud, urine, and, yep, human feces. 
You know, all that footage you saw of kids moshing and sliding Pete Rose style in the mud at Woodstock 99? Yeah, they were diving headfirst into a hearty portion of human crap. Woodstock 99 organizers were smart in bringing in around 2,500 portable toilets, but that's where their vision stopped. They didn't anticipate how often those toilets would require to be emptied. By the second day, the overflow from the portables spilled out to create a bacteria-infested cesspool that stretched the length of the grounds. Eventually, people who encountered the backed-up stalls relieved themselves in public in what they called the piss pool. A festival employee who was working the ticket gate said, Kids were complaining that sewage from overflowing toilets was going into their tents. They were sleeping in it. They couldn't believe that was what they were expected to live with. By the end of the festival, at least 1,200 tons of solid waste and 500,000 gallons of urine were produced by concert goers. The contaminated mud made its way to the concert spaces too. While Limp Biscuit didn't instigate the destruction of Woodstock 99, the majority of the negative press coverage related to the festival was directed at them. The claim was that the band's Saturday late afternoon set was the catalyst for what occurred over the 24 subsequent hours. In defense of Limp Biscuit, the crowd was already in berserker mode, even before the band took the stage. One spin music journalist described it best, at this point, hurtling shoes in mud was an amateur pursuit. People moved on to batteries, disposable cameras, and rocks the size of hockey pucks. The media tower to the right of the stage, the camera platform to the left, and the control tower to the middle of the airfield were swarming with kids who peeled off each structure's protective plywood like worn band-aids. But once Limp Biscuit launched into Just Like This, the energy amplified. Singer Fred Durst received a lot of criticism for how he spoke to the crowd, especially after festival organizers asked him to quell the unruliness. Instead, the band played their fury-filled hit, Break Stuff. Ever have one of those days when everything's f***ed up and you just want to break stuff? Durst asked before jumping into the heavy jam, even crowd surfing on a plywood board during the song. Ahead of the Red Hot Chili Peppers closing set for Woodstock 99, the anti-gun organization PAX gave out 100,000 candles with instructions that the audience would light them during Under the Bridge. Mmm, bad idea. As Rolling Stone's Brian Hyatt reported, the peace candles became the kindling for the fires that became part of the riot. As the bonfires began raging on the periphery of the stage during the Chili Peppers' performance, Joseph Griffo, the then mayor of Rome asked lead singer Anthony Kiedis to say something to the audience to calm them down. As Mayor Griffo recalled, Kiedis said, What do you think, they're going to listen to me? Instead of heeding the mayor's advice, the Chili Peppers, with a completely buck-naked flea, ended their hour-long set with a cover of Jimi Hendrix's Fire. Fairly apropos of the situation, considering there were three active bonfires set near the stage. Before the song, Kiedis surveyed the airbase and said, Holy <laughs> it looks like apocalypse now out there. Then you can hear Flea ask Kiedis if he was sure they wanted to play the song. Kiedis screamed, <laughs> yeah, and the band launched into fire with wild abandon. During the song, the number of fires grew into double digits and a Mercedes-Benz was flipped over. That was set on fire too. Naturally, the song caused them a lot of subsequent criticism. The band has always claimed that the song was in their set list that night, not a brazen way to show solidarity with the fire starters around them. But Anthony Kiedis made a comment between songs that they were mixing and matching the songs they were playing that night. So you decide for yourself. Drummer Chad Smith later told Yahoo Music, I remember we were getting ready to go on, and they were going to do a tribute to the original Woodstock 69 performer Jimi Hendrix after we played. His sister came to us, and we'd met her before. We'd done some other stuff with the Hendrix experience. And she said, hey, I know you guys do Jimi Hendrix songs. What do you think if I could get a Hendrix song before? Like as your last song before the tribute thing, you know? As the Chili Peppers walked off the stage, things really got out of control. More cars and ATMs were demolished. Vendor booths were trampled. Looters were everywhere. At least four cases of sexual assault were investigated by state police, but media personnel and staff in Rome that weekend believe the number is likely much higher. 
And to be frank, all you have to do is watch a few minutes of the crowd footage to do your own math. Yes, due to the scorching temperatures and free love principles that define the first Woodstock, many women decided to go topless, and in many cases, bottomless. This seemed to empower male concertgoers to grope their female counterparts, or speak to them however they pleased. The interactions amplified from there. According to the written reports, the four known cases all happened in the campgrounds surrounding the stages, but multiple witnesses saw assaults during performances, most notably during sets by Korn and Limp Bizkit. All in all, Woodstock 99 was a catastrophe. As the MTV's elder statesman, an appalled Kurt Loder, later said, it was dangerous to be around. The whole scene was scary. There were just waves of hatred bouncing around the place. It was like a concentration camp. To get in, you get frisked, to make sure you're not bringing in any water or food that would prevent you from buying from their outrageously priced booths. You wallow around in garbage and human waste. There was a palpable mood of anger. As fun as musical festivals seem in theory, they're still fairly horrible. Promoters still gouge on ticket prices, and it still costs hundreds to buy food and alcohol. But who knows, thanks to the current world situation, concerts may never be the same again. So what do you think? How big of a failure was Woodstock 99? Or do you think it was a success? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other music stories from our weird history.